Hello and welcome to week three of our oral communication course. This week we're going to be looking at argumentation, which is the process of constructing argument, and we're going to be considering the writing of opinion pieces with a view to working towards our next submission, which is an audio opinion piece. I myself have spent some time analysing opinion pieces. Um, as a researcher, I was considering media discourse. Um, but for the purposes of this course, we're actually going to be looking at the skills required to, to write them and some of the elements that go into constructing opinion pieces. Over my career as a journalist, I spent some time writing opinion pieces very briefly for Eastern Eye newspaper, which is based out of London. Um, but I've also written um, other kinds of opinion piece and other kinds of uh, commentary for, for various publications. So opinion pieces essentially are either the leader or editorial of a traditional newspaper or uh, print publication, but they are also those opinion pieces or commentary that are, that are written by commentators, written by thought leaders, and crafted and created for, for broadcast. And that's really what we're going to be thinking about for the purposes of oral communication uh, and, this, and this course. Um, a quick word then about the difference between the crafting of this assignment and the previous one. With your how-to assignment, it's likely that you either came up with a script and memorized it, or you worked off bullet points and used those as prompts to actually deliver your presentation. Because you were speaking to camera and because you were trying to construct something that was probably conversational, it is likely that your language came out in a certain way and your ideas came out in a certain way. The difference with this is that it's likely to be something that you will write and then deliver. And because it's actually a written piece, it's going to sound quite different than when you're actually uh, speaking a, you know, to a topic or about a topic and delivering it extemporaneously, perhaps without notes. So in this case, I suspect that your ideas are likely to be, if not more complicated, certainly presented in a more complicated way, maybe because of the grammar uh, and the structure of the piece and maybe because of the language in particular. So we're going to talk a bit more about that throughout this course but I just wanted to mention that here. The piece itself I would like for you to deliver on a platform called SoundCloud. It's actually um, a site on which you can uh, sign up for free and have an account and it's one of those um, platforms that is sometimes used by podcasters to house the material of um, uh, for their audio delivery. So focusing on argument for us is the process by which we consider what the components of an argument are and why they're there, um, how they're working and what impact they're, they're ultimately having. So as a central part of this course, obviously we're focused on communicating orally and as we're discovering, uh, many parts of the communication although they're spoken in the delivery, they involve some kind of writing and construction in thinking about the uh, kind of setup to the piece. And I feel that being able to take apart and construct an argument is a useful skill inside and outside of this course. And uh, essentially when you are building an argument, you are using claim 
and counterclaim in a precise way, in a thorough way, in a critical way, and ultimately you would seek to win your argument. Now that doesn't mean that we're talking about the back and forth quarrel that you might have with someone when you're arguing, um, or being argumentative in the general sense of being disagreeable, but rather the principle of being persuasive, and um, that is contained within this uh, discipline of rhetoric. And within that uh, subject of rhetoric, we're really concerned with the specific level, level of argumentation, which is the notion of claim. So here's a visual giving us an overview of what we're doing today. As I've said, argumentation and claims and the opinion piece. I want to spend a moment just talking about what we mean by opinion piece because there are different types. If we think about broadcast and print as um, types of media, they actually contain different types of commentary. Um, I want to do that thing where I tell you what it is that we're after by first excluding the things that we're not going to be considering. So the leader or um, editorial, as I mentioned at the beginning, is the kind of piece that's written um, anonymously. It's often written by a, an editor or um, a publisher, but it doesn't carry a byline. And it's often in the middle of the newspaper next to the uh, letters pages and has this uh, institutional voice. It speaks on behalf of the media organisation and often uses the um, first person plural, we, to talk about the um, we as an organisation, we as the public, we as subsectors of society, we as Trinidad and Tobago. Um, and tries to uh, write in a way that, if not neutral, because an opinion piece obviously can carry a particular bias, if not neutral, sometimes it tries to strike a, a balance by weighing up various sides of an argument, um, and other times, if it is pointed in a particular direction, it tries to... Um, neutralize in some way where it's coming from by claiming at least to be the voice of um, the people. So we're not going for that kind of opinion piece. We have opinion pieces as well that are technical. Um, we have opinion pieces that could be written by celebrity and often I think when we have a celebrity piece uh, we're interested in the story that they have to tell in the kind of day-to-day -day aspects of uh, this person's life or their interaction. And actually for this, we're not really interested in that kind of piece either. The reason we're focusing on argumentation and uh, claim with respect to a component of argumentation is because what I think is a really useful exercise is to actually construct a written argument that you will deliver orally that is almost like the components of a debate and in that way it's going to be information rich it can have a narrative that frames it meaning it can tell a story and be structured around a story but the story the the components of the individual experience that simply drive the piece are not going to be in the foreground we really want to um, explore this idea of constructing an argument that has a claim, justification, provides evidence and, you know, is an opinion but um, is based on something um, of substance. So far in this course we've been thinking and talking about the oral communication um, in to some degree by genre, meaning the actual uh, the actual type of um, piece you're producing, like a speech or um, 
a presentation or a how-to. And we've also been talking about the actual assignments a little bit uh, in terms of how you construct, um, construct them. I actually want us to take a look at this diagram though because I think it gives us a slightly bigger picture um, in considering some of the elements we're having to think about. So I'd like to start with purpose and work around clockwise and then end with context. So when we were thinking about the how-to article, the purpose was really to be informational and entertaining. For the purposes of our opinion piece, we're seeking to be persuasive or to use the word in the box, uh, to use the word in the, in the circle rather that's indicated to convince. And the way we're going to have to do that is by weaving fact and opinion we're going to be using claims, different types of claim that we're going to talk about. And we're also having to consider the degree to which we foreground story opposed to argument. And are there ways in which we can kind of interweave these two? So these are a few things you're having to think about. With the how-to assignment, we had a brief of a particular kind of audience, and that is going to be indicated for this assignment in the preamble to, uh, to the assignment, which will be on my learning. So look out for those details. Now, when we start to think of ourselves as the writer or creator of a piece, we're having to think about a number of things. And um, the diagram here talks about our age and location, our cultural perspective, our experiences. And all of that, I think, is um, really interesting and useful as a, as a starting point when thinking about, you know, what are we bringing to this type of article or this kind of presentation? Um, I just want to raise the issue of something that's going on in the wider publishing community. Um, so it's not so much for this assignment, but it's just something for us to think about. There has been this movement in publishing, particularly novel publishing, but um, I suppose short story as well, that talks about own voice, meaning am I the right person, do I have the right kind of experiences to actually tell this kind of story, whether it's a story with a protagonist who is dealing with disability, whether it's someone of colour, whether it's someone of a particular sexual orientation, whether it's gendered, etc, etc, all kinds of layers. And, you know, there are pluses and minuses uh, when thinking about whether or not you should tackle a story that perhaps you don't have a personal experience of and, um, you know, how you're going to, to go about doing that. So there is this term BIPOC, which refers to Black and Indigenous people of colour. And um, in England, there's a term BAME, which is Black and Asian Minority Ethnic. And, um, you know, whether you feel part of that group, whether you don't identify with it or not, is you know entirely your call. I myself, as someone who are mixed, feel that I you know fall in between sometimes when I read requirements for submissions to um, particular uh, types of article or submissions to, to journals. So you know it's a navigation really, and I'm not saying you have to come down one way or the other. And you shouldn't write about things that aren't your aren't within your immediate experience. But you should just think about that and understand that there is this movement outside there, which raises that as a question, and it causes all kinds of problems, um, particularly in other jurisdictions. I'm thinking of America. There was a recent example where um, someone who was part um, Latina and part Irish wrote from the perspective of a Mexican. And because she was of Puerto Rican heritage and not Mexican, it caused some controversy because she got a big publishing deal. So anyway, all of that is uh, out there for you to, to be mindful of. Um, in terms of the topic, I think we can think about topic and think about burrowing down into a kind of very specific type of article that we want to write, a specific kind of opinion piece. And this is something that we need to think about when constructing our 
our piece. We need to think about the angle. What is our approach going to be to tell this story? So let's say we were thinking about writing something located in Trinidad and Tobago. We decided we want to do an environment piece. And more than that, we want to do a piece about littering and the kinds of littering that go on in society. Um, we might think about doing it from a policy perspective. We might think about doing it from um, an experiential perspective of having been to a beach or elsewhere, a river, some natural site, and being surrounded by uh, rubbish and littering. And um, it may be our own story. It may be a story that we've heard or reported on, meaning it's somebody else's account and we're writing it, and that's also okay. Um, I mean, but there are all manner of ways in which you could tackle this story and I want you to think about the angle you're taking as well. What makes it interesting often for a reader or for a listener is when you bring a particular kind of very personal um, perspective on it. And so that's something to think about. Now the context um, asks you to consider the circumstances surrounding the writing and uh, include the time, where and when and the location. So that's all about specificity. Um, of the events and I and I really do think that if we make them specific we don't have to give the article a news angle it doesn't have to be current affairs in that way but why would somebody want to read that today or listen to it today why are they going to feel that this deals with the current kind of context and make them feel that it's contemporary rather than something that could have been written or um, spoken 10 years ago so some things to think about when constructing your persuasive opinion piece that is going to be spoken. So you need to think as well about the delivery and whether it sounds right as you speak it, not only as you write it, but whether it works in your voice, whether these are your kinds of words or whether you're just looking for a complicated vocabulary, for example, that doesn't quite work. All things to consider. So I want to include some history of, about rhetoric because I think it helps us locate what it is we're doing and actually um, helps us understand too that we're not doing something that is so remote from our own experience. We are actually uh, quite familiar with the way arguments work and argumentation works, even if we haven't thought about it in this way. So I've included the image of classical philosophers because, um, and I took this from a site and I've included the citation at the end, I just wanted to uh, mention that, and I'm reading from, from the site, that the history of rhetoric actually predates the Greek founders of Western philosophy, which include the likes of Socrates and Plato. So this is something that was going on even if it hadn't been defined way before, you know, these um, kind of Greek icons of uh, thought and idea and argument that, that we would have heard of. Um, in ancient Greece and Rome, rhetoric was considered to be part of the art of persuasion. And in these societies, it was spoken, it was done in public, and would have been prized among the likes of politicians and legal experts and educators who would have been, they would have been expected to delineate arguments uh, in public for, for public dissemination. So they would be the ones who'd be required to break down the contents of a particular um, edict or, or um, policy um, in order to help people understand where it comes from and what it, what it really means. So, in that we're talking about persuasion, what we're really doing is talking about the idea of a polemic, which is uh, an attack um, and an attack on a particular point of view or a debate. So I have included some images on the right of different places where debate and discussion happen so that we can see the roots of this persuasive exchange that, that I'm talking about. So the top image is the lower house of Parliament, 
It's called the House of Commons, and that's um, in England's bicameral parliament. In Trinidad and Tobago, we have our House of Representatives, um, which is which is the equivalent. In the middle, we have an image at Oxford University Union, um, and Morgan Freeman is actually being interviewed. And in any kind of interview, or or maybe we should say in a certain kind of interview um, that's being presented. Uh, as a public lecture, we have someone express their ideas, and you know they're they're um, coerced in to give us details and explanation and justification for why they say the things they do and come up with the ideas that they have. Um, so I'm going to come back to this idea of justification in the next slide. Um, but at the bottom, we have a representation of a UK barrister, and that's a kind of lawyer who in English courts, at least, presents the arguments. So a barrister opposed to um, a solicitor. Uh, in Trinidad and Tobago, I believe, we, we use the, the term lawyer and lawyers do both of those things. They either uh, construct the arguments and, you know, kind of use um, cases in order to construct their arguments, but they also present them in court. So uh, it's interesting, though, I think, that we actually talk about legal arguments in a court of law. Um, it's also interesting that when we think about certain kinds of sport, like tennis, that happens in a court. Um, we talk about basketball happening in a basketball court. Um, and I would want to pose to you uh, the question, why is that? And I posit that it's something to do with the idea of an exchange a back and forth. So this is something that's actually quite familiar to us. It's not um, completely, completely strange. So I've said throughout this lecture that in talking about the building blocks of argument that we're going to focus on, I want us to uh, look at the distinctive types of claim so here we are. Um, there are five types of claim, according to many people. But if you study argumentation or anything related to rhetoric and got deeper into that um, analysis, I think you would find people making distinctions and coming up with a higher number. But nonetheless, um, these are the five that I want to talk about and to leave with you um, as a way of thinking about what you're doing when you're building your argument and constructing your opinion piece. I'm actually going to include on my learning a couple of resources. Um, one is a PDF that lists these claims and goes into some more details uh, of the kinds of questions that are uh, attached to the claim and therefore kind of define it and the other is a website um, with some more detail and slightly different different points so it's hard to um, get real value by going into talking about claims because I actually think if you look at them and if you look at the PDF and go to the website you'll see that they all are pretty self-evident but I guess it's worth saying that when someone makes a claim about something you know I like smoking let's say that is an opinion and for someone to have an, a counter to that they would have to question the degree to which the person actually meant that in other words it's its value um, smoking causes cancer is is true according to the science but of course many of you will know people who smoke and who don't get cancer and then there are cancers caused by other things other than smoking so you could build an argument in counter to this idea of smoking causing cancer by raising the prospect of okay so this is causative but to what degree is that true um, we are, I think, fairly clear about, you know, defining things and the need to define things. Um, 
let's say you made a claim or wanted to talk about love being a wonderful thing, um, that sets you on this very difficult road, I think, um, if, you're, if you're getting pernickety about it, in talking about what is love, where does it come from? And, you know, you might actually construct a very interesting piece around that, um, about maybe love in song or love in film, and you know your viewpoints on it and how it has shaped the way we we view love today that could be very interesting um policy is of course this um organization or authoritative way of looking at something in terms of authority way of looking at something rather um in in terms of looking at what what should we do about it how should we govern it how should we control it and um, fact is placed here on on what basis do we do we know this so there's this quite difficult position of how is it perceived how do we perceive it um, you know people talk about ontology meaning to does this even exist and epistemology how do we know this what what is actually at the basis of our knowing so we can get quite complicated about it i'm not sure it's of tremendous value to kind of dig into it, except to say that the claims are useful for when you're constructing an argument and they are the building blocks on which um, I think we can create really nuanced opinion pieces and you know get ourselves thinking about some of the details. The reason I've put Morgan Freeman here uh, is to remind me that um, he was in the previous slide when I spoke about um, him being at Oxford Union and he really did at Oxford University Student Union give a give a um, interview about film but of course Morgan has had to answer claims around sexual harassment and he as an as a person um, is, is, is useful when we come to talk about justification so the idea is that when someone is forming, forming an argument, they need to provide evidence. And I actually think that talking about justification, we're, we're really looking at a level above the claim. So anytime you make a point in your opinion piece, I think you could ask yourself, on what basis am I saying this? How am I justified in saying this? And equally, how am I... What am I um, excluding? What are the limitations of what I'm able to, to say about this? If you're making an argument that, you know, would have a reasonable kind of counter to it. So justification is just one broad brushstroke that someone can ask of an argument. Justify it. Explain what you mean. Tell me why you mean it. And the claim, any one type of claim, could be mobilised as evidence to provide that justification. So this, I promise, is my very last Morgan Freeman slide, and I'm only using it because it's a um, video of five quotes that he has said, and I think it's useful to uh, illustrate and talk about some of the uh, concepts within argument that I think are relevant for us to think about. So I'd like you to pause the lecture, take a look at the Morgan Freeman video, the link is below, and then come back to me. Okay, so having looked at that video, we can say one thing uh, is common about all of those quotes, and that is that they are all opinion. So um, they're all based on particular value judgments of some sort. And I think we can pick each one apart, we can unpack it and look at certain things that uh, can be derived from, from what was said. So the first quote is, there is no bad religion, there are only bad people. Now one of the things that we can look for in a claim is that um, it can be cyclical. The argument can be cyclical when you get the repetition of words. And I think that can be a very attractive way of saying something. But of course, what he's saying is 
uh, in essence, the religion itself is not bad, but people are bad. But you could argue, and this is the cyclical part, well, people create religions. And therefore, how can you separate out the two? Effectively, if we were using the metaphor of a person and their personality, he's saying, don't blame the person, blame the personality. But can those two things really be separated? So that's um, an indication of a cyclical argument. The second quote, I would say, is a motivational type of quote. Um, and what he's saying, in essence, is don't quit. But the corollary to that is to say, is that really good advice? Should I keep going? Should someone keep going when all that they've done has led to naught? Um, I think you should um, think about this quote as being a useful motivation, but one that you could actually quite easily pick apart. I mean, one has to know when something is dead and therefore uh, be able to, to move on. So we can kind of pick it apart in that way. We can come up with a counter argument in that way. The quote number three is, um, let me take a look at it. There is no perfect man in the world. There are only perfect, what was the word? Only perfect intentions. Um, I think that's um, really interesting. And I think one could argue that maybe it reveals something about the way Morgan views the world. Um, and it almost feels like a justification for making a mistake or for accepting your own mistakes. And maybe it's something that one might mobilize when they've been caught out. Um, and therefore, you know, in some ways one could say that's quite telling. Um, so the quote about the movies I'm going to leave and move on to the number one quote. Jealousy is a good indication that you're doing things the right way. People never get jealous of losers. Well, maybe someone is jealous because they feel they've been hard done by or they've been let down by a system. Can someone not accept your greatness but still feel that they deserve better? I, I think they can. So you could pick that apart and um, come up with a good counter argument. But my point for including all of these is to say no matter how nicely worded something is that you've constructed, it can actually be unpacked. You can be made to interrogate something or see it differently. So it's important to come up with your arguments and think of the counter arguments even if you don't include them. Um, but don't get so caught up in your ideas that you think they're impenetrable because they're absolutely not. So now we're going to talk a bit about the assignment itself. And as I've said, it's more than just a point of view. It's more than just your opinions and uh, a story in which you carry us through a series of opinions. Um, it is this idea of building an opinion piece that's based on argument, therefore based on claim and counterclaim, uh, and substance, material substance of the idea, and you're actually writing it in order to, to speak about it, or to, to deliver it rather, um, on SoundCloud. So what I want to do in this section is to look at some examples of opinion writing and then briefly indicate some of the elements of your assignment that maybe you can consider for this audio environment. But what I'm speaking about is opinion writing in general as a topic. The specific parameters of your assignment, where they are specific, will be posted elsewhere. So they'll be on my e-learning. And I want you to look out for those, please. So with each of these slides, I'm going to try and make a particular point and try and build up the detail of what I'm talking about, either by referring you to something else 
or by, by talking about it a little bit, by explicating the point I'm making. So I'm including in this um, lecture two links, one to um, an editorial, an opinion piece, uh, about An Sang Suu Kyi, who is the leader, political leader of Myanmar, of what was Burma. Um, and the second is one about pop music. So I recommend that you pause the lecture, you go down to the links below, listen to those, and then come back. Okay, so as you would have heard, the first uh, the first piece on SoundCloud is this um, piece about political behaviour, essentially, and about personality in politics. Uh, An Sang Suu Kyi actually has a Nobel Peace Prize, and so it is understood that people would be critical, the international community and certain elements of the international community would be critical of the way that she is uh, behaving with respect to um, displaced people in Burma and uh, coming up against the military junta, which even though it's no longer in power, still the, the military still has um, significant kind of uh, political sway. So that's uh, what I want to say about that. The second piece about pop music um, actually starts off in a way that sounds um, a little bit like a leader, a little bit like an editorial piece rather than a common, rather than a uh, column, if you like, or a commentary. But then it gets more personal, and the author talks about his, you know, love affair with the likes of ABBA. Um, but the point I want to make about these two pieces is that they are written and then delivered. So one of the first things to bear in mind is you are delivering these pieces. And as I said elsewhere, you should think about writing them. And I suggest you start writing it this week. And then you actually record it and hear how it sounds and see where the words feel natural and where they kind of uh, catch you up. Or you sound, or you don't quite sound like yourself for some reason, um, because the delivery is an important point. We're actually going to be listening to you and hearing the arguments that you you formulate hearing the opinion piece and you know some of what you do is going to be or some of the uh, some of the mark and some of the quality is going to come out in the writing and then a good portion of it is going to come out in the delivery because that's that's how we're going to receive the piece and so you should be mindful of that Here I want to talk a little bit about what we can call voice and um, for the purposes of our discussion let's say it's the distinctive characteristics that make you um, make it clear to an audience who it is that we're listening to. So you could think about uh, a musician and from the from the person's literal voice, Madonna, Michael Jackson, Beyonce, whoever it is that you listen to, you recognise uh, a certain quality in the way that they sound. Well, writers actually have those kinds of uh, markers too, if you like. I suspect that by now, having heard the way I'm trying to construct these lectures and deliver the lectures, even if you didn't hear me, if it was written down, and you had a transcript, you might be able to tell it was me rather than somebody else, maybe because of the kinds of examples I use, or the speech patterns that I have, or maybe, you know, some of the details from the slides, because you know the kinds of things that I tend to refer to and speak about. So we can talk about um, a voice. Um, this particular slide shows uh, a newspaper column from someone called Jeremy Clarkson, um, Jeremy Clarkson was the host of Top Gear, which was a programme all about cars that was on the BBC and it was really popular. And then he got kicked off the show for uh, doing something bad. Um, but here he's written a column and you can tell that this is a 
tabloid newspaper because of some of the ways in which it is written. The language is punchy, the ideas are concise. Each paragraph, if you look at it, and let me just make sure I'm saying the right thing, typically has one idea in it. Is that true? I think so. One or two ideas perhaps, but certainly it's not a series of complicated ideas with subordinate clauses and a lot of... I mean there's presupposition, meaning there is the basis for saying something. Um, so a presupposition might be... let me find one for you. Um, we have to wear a mask, but not in not in a pub, and whatever happened to washing our hands. So the presupposition in asking that question is, well, there are a number of layers to it. One is that, you know, it's assumed knowledge, people, people know it. And in asking that question, he's saying that uh, the government is in effect dismissing the idea of washing your hands. Um, and it's kind of a, a rhetorical question in the sense that he's saying we're no longer um, talking about it and therefore uh, it seems like we've moved off it and it's no longer important. But anyway, the, the point to say is um, there are ways in which this is written that are punchy. It has a distinctiveness about it. Uh, if you read something else by Jeremy Clarkson, you kind of know it's him. Uh, in a way, you could almost imagine him as this kind of irritated man talking to you know some friend in a in a in a pub or in a restaurant it's a kind of a a voice in the sense of being able to imagine who that person is from the kind of language that they use um and that's something you should try and work towards work towards being distinctive being yourself and maybe trying to inject some kind of character into the piece that you're delivering. So should your opinion piece be balanced or not? I think there is something of a misnomer in applying this idea of balance, this concept of balance to media. Often there's this idea that in news, and this is where I think it comes from, um, a story should present a counter-argument or the voice of the other side, um, depending on what the story is about. And while I think that can be useful in a story to indicate that there, you know, there is another side to it, often media pieces present the world in a kind of a binary, and it's a site of conflict, and therefore you get that kind of um, skewed discussion. So what is the situation with opinion pieces? Well, opinion pieces certainly don't need to be balanced, meaning that you don't need to give equal weight in terms of volume or detail to, you know, the counter arguments that you're presenting. So what am I talking about then? If I'm saying in building an argument, you need to think about uh, claim and counter claim. I'm saying that there is a difference with someone you know presenting an argument and being manipulative and someone presenting an argument and spinning it so what we're talking about is using claims and building the argument we're not talking about with every argument you present you present the opposite because that i think will lead to either this concept of balance or neutrality but it wouldn't be a distinctive point of view i think um, so much better to go with your opinion to uh, construct your arguments using using the claims and where there is an obvious counter you mention it and justify your argument for you know ignoring it um, rather than trying to actually present something that uh, goes down the middle of the road and you know presents both sides of a story equally unless it is your intention to do a positive and negative of a particular uh, situation. I still think, however, there would be benefit to indicating what your preference is rather than trying to uh, just go straight down the middle.
So to what degree is this story, is this opinion piece meant to be about you as an individual? I am saying that you could actually write a whole opinion piece that is just a series of anecdotes. It's going to be a series of um, stories that connect into this personal account and everything is told through your eyes and experiences. I think that might be interesting, it might resonate with someone, make them see the world differently because of how you uh, interacted with a particular situation. However, as a way of ensuring that this becomes a teaching moment, if you like, I think you need to consider what is going to be an informed opinion on an issue. So your informed opinion is built up with your justification for why you're saying something. Um, it's possible to overload a story, overload an opinion piece with, you know, kind of details um, and therefore the story doesn't move along, which is the other side of not including yourself in it at all. And so you're really needing to strike a balance. I think it's better to see your piece as a way in which you interweave point of view about a particular topic and particular kind of factual arguments. So it doesn't mean using statistics or locating it historically, um, unless that's your central focus, but it does mean uh, trying to connect these two things. So if you were writing a piece, say, about the perception of right-wing dictators through the ages, and you came up or you ended with this kind of idea of talking about modern day politics and maybe even a modern day American politics, um, I think you should you know, have your story and essentially build up to a thesis which you deliver, in this case, at the end. Um, and thinking about a thesis, thinking about a thesis statement, which is effectively your point of view and, uh, and some kind of structural way through the story, is a really good way of deciding uh, how you're going to deliver an argument that's that's based around some kind of personal opinion, but not solely about your own story. So I titled this slide, Your Opinion Matters, to remind you that this piece is really uh, from your unique point of view. It's very much about your perspective on it. Um, the article shown here is actually a column from a uh, journalist and writer and um, she's actually written this piece in the UK Guardian newspaper and you'll notice the headline takes a very definite stance and that headline reflects, I think, the tone of the piece, her equivocation on what it means to be a winner. She's proud but not completely happy and I think um, if you read the article you'll see it kind of goes back and forth in this way about what the success means but why it's not completely fulfilling. So she starts with a personal account and then moves into a historical perspective because here it's relevant. Um, one of the things that I learned as a journalist in writing news and opinion is that you should write your headline first. You can change it later and you may well find as you write your piece it doesn't quite hold and you need to reword it or maybe even completely um, you know scratch it and start over but it gives you a very definite target and I suspect that if your headline is wishy-washy your piece comes out that way too and so you want to work against that. Um, of course if you are writing a piece that is heavily based on claims that need a constant kind of counter argument and you are going for this kind of uh, neutral back and forth uh, or a neutral you're trying to strike a neutral tone by going back and forth or you're making a comparison then sometimes that kind of headline uh, is difficult to construct in the beginning in a way that you know kind of makes your piece distinctive but I want you to at least try that and see if it see if it works for you um, and uh, note that some opinions within your piece will need more justification than others some will, you know, kind of stand on their own, they're an opinion, and you don't need to uh, kind of add too much around it to support it. 
others may need a kind of deeper argument. So you'll think as well about the balance of your piece and where you need to add more detail and where you can kind of step back and just let the um, ideas speak for themselves. So we're coming towards the end of the lecture and I just want to spend a moment pinning down some details about something that I've mentioned but haven't really uh, explicated much. And that is that you're actually writing these pieces, these opinion pieces, for the audio environment. And therefore there's a need to write visually. Um, and as I say on the slide, clear, easy description, complete sentences, match vocabulary to the kind of content that you're working um, towards presenting, all of those things help. I think if you actually sit and listen to pieces on radio or podcast, you'll actually find that the, the thing that carries you along, the thing that actually makes you feel immersed in a story, is when you get visual descriptions, or you get descriptions of smells or uh, sounds, anything that will actually kind of uh, bring in your other senses. And that really will, I think, help carry the narrative. So even though we're seeing a picture on the screen here of a rose, in SoundCloud you, you wouldn't have that. So I've written, he handed me a rose, a symbol of love, a dense swirl of ruddy pink, its perfume was warm like candy floss. I'm not sure whether that necessarily is moving for you, but I've simply used it to uh, explain my, my point, which is that if you describe something and you refer to its, its smells and you refer to its smells in a way that links to something else, I think someone might get the idea that this was a sweet smelling rose um, and the idea of it being a dense swirl of ruddy pink gives you a kind of visual of the kind of pink it is. Uh, all of those things I think will help. Remember of course that your voice needs to modulate and you need to use that to uh, help make your piece sound interesting. Um, and you need to feel like, or the audience certainly needs to feel, that you're narrating a text rather than just uh, reading out a piece of writing. So you should test it on someone and let them listen and give you their impression of whether or not they felt um, they felt moved or they felt connected to your piece or they were able to follow your, follow your story and your argument. So this is why we are not going to ask for your transcripts along with these pieces. We're merely going to listen and see whether we're convinced and carried through your opinion piece rather than reading the transcript to see whether the, the arguments hold together. Uh, if you do that with somebody who's listening and you get them to close their eyes or turn away and just listen to you speaking, you'll get from them an impression of um, whether they were actually compelled and they found it intriguing or interesting. They may not agree with your points of view and that's, that's all okay, but nonetheless they would hopefully be gripped by what you actually have to say. So I'm going to leave you with a piece to listen to. This is a TED talk by a boy named Cole Blakeway and he's talking about the value of being different. But it's more than just a story about himself, even though it is a story that um, kind of foregrounds him as an individual. I think he does a really good job of interweaving his personal perspectives with the, with the narrative and the and the uh, particular argument that he's building about, um, well, I, I won't give it away. You'll actually listen and hear what he has to say. But he actually runs through his delivery and ends with his most important message. So this is a payoff, which he has placed in the emphatic position of the end. Um, but an emphatic position, as I've probably said in a previous lecture, is not only something that's indicated by structure, a beginning, a middle, and an end, or a transition, for example. An emphatic position can be something you build up to and you create because it's a moment of suspense or important in a particular presentation. So I want to leave you 
with this. There's a link down below for you to, to listen to it and um, hear his message and see what you think. And with that, I thank you and I look forward to hearing your pieces.